All right. Um, are you guys ready to roll? Agnes? <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready. We, should we just start letting people in? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to let people in. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We're just gonna give it a couple more minutes to let other folks trickle in and then we'll get started.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the panel. Thank you so much to everybody uh, for joining us. If um, anybody needs interpretation in Tagalog or in Filipino, you can click the circular um, interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. It should be right next to the reactions button and um, the Tagalog option should pop up. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can contact Lizelle Tanglao at the email address on the screen. Um, if you would like to take a screenshot um, of this slide, just to make sure you have that information with you in case any technical problems come up during the panel, um, you can do that. And uh, if you're streaming this um, panel on Facebook or any other social media platforms, um, please note that interpretation will not be available on those platforms. It'll just be available on Zoom. Um, so thank you everyone for um, joining us this evening. My name is Agnes Constante. I'm a journalist based in LA and I will be um, moderating the panel this evening. Um, and we're holding this panel for a couple of reasons. The main one is that um, it's part of a data fellowship project that I'm working on at the University of Southern California's Center for Health Journalism about the impact of COVID-19 on the Filipino American community. Uh, the project is gonna consist of three stories that will run in NBC Asian America, which is an online news site that covers the Asian American community. Um, one of the components of the project is to do community engagement work and that work is meant to help shape my reporting priorities for this project and the way that I've approached this work is by partnering with a couple of Filipino American organizations, most notably the Filipino Young Leaders Program, as well as the UC Davis Bulletin Center for Filipino Studies, Filipino Workers Center and the Southern California Filipinx American Student Alliance to um, create this Facebook group that uh, provides culturally tailored and relevant resources for the Filipino American community about the COVID-19 pandemic because um, there's really just a lack of these culturally tailored resources for the community. Um, and secondly, it's meant to be a space where folks can ask questions, share their experiences around the pandemic. Um, everything that takes place in the group is helping to guide and shape how my stories and how this fellowship project turns out. Um, and so um, one of the ways that's happened is we learned through this Facebook group that one area that the Filipino American and community wants to learn more about is vaccines. And that's why we're holding this panel about this topic tonight. Um, I would like to extend an invitation to anyone in the Filipino American community who's interested in joining um, the group to do so. Um, and you can do so by uh, visiting facebook.com um, slash group slash Tayo help. Um, and we will provide that link also in the chat. Um, and now I just wanna introduce the panelists um, for this evening. We have four speakers tonight. Uh, we'll first be hearing from Dr. Joyce Javier, who is an attending physician and researcher at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Um, she's also an associate professor of clinical pediatrics and preventive medicine at Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Next, we'll hear from Susana Gonzalez, who's the director of education and content at the News Literacy Project, which is a national nonpartisan education nonprofit that provides resources to help educators, students, and the public sort fact from fiction. We'll next hear from Dr. Antonio Moya, who is an assistant professor of neurology for Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And Dr. Moya is also the co-founder of the Council of Young Filipino Americans in Medicine. And we'll also hear from Melanie Sabaroliwag, who is an assistant professor and director at Cal State Los Angeles' Masters in Public Health program. Um, if any of you have questions for any of the panelists um, throughout this this panel, please feel free to put them in the chat at any time. And we'll have a couple of minutes at the end um, to go over questions from the audience. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over right now to Dr. Joyce Javier, who's going to talk to us about um, vaccine basics and some common questions and concerns from the Filipino American community about the vaccine. All right, do you guys see my slides okay now? <laughs> I can't see you, so <laughs> are we good? Mm, all right, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Are we, you can see my slides okay? Yes? Okay. Yes, okay. you can see them. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so thank you so much, Agnes, for that um, kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, 
I'm also the, a senior advisor for the Tayo Help um, Phil Pro Caretaker Project, um, and also the principal investigator for the Filipino Family Health Initiative at CHLA. Um, before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge one of our interns who helped with these slides, Paul Kunanan. Um, and I really am grateful for his assistance with this presentation. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So let's just start with how mRNA vaccines work. So what happens is scientists have taken part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus's code called messenger RNA. And this tells our cells what to build and, and then they coat them in a lipid, which is like a fat so that they can enter the body's cells. Then this is actually injected to your arm. Then there's three steps that make your body um, form the um, antibodies against the COVID uh, virus. First, the first step is create, where the mRNA instructs your own cells on how to create a part of the protein that the virus has. This part of the protein is the spike protein, and your muscle cells will take up this mRNA and read the instructions and build the spike protein that is also on the coronavirus. The next step is learn. Then your immune system will recognize that the protein is different and then it'll start to produce antibodies as well as train your immune cells to learn to recognize it in the future. And then when your body sees coronavirus in the future, some antibodies will be there to start protecting immediately. And immune cells will be primed to increase that protection. Many vaccines consist of a weakened or inactivated virus that when injected into the body activates the immune system. The current vac vaccines that we have available, Pfizer and Moderna, actually utilize technology that does not require a weakened or inactivated virus. Instead, it employs a synthetic or laboratory made molecule called messenger RNA that is injected into the body. So what are the benefits of getting vaccinated? Well, the virus that causes COVID-19 replicates very quickly. And without the vaccine, your body has to identify it and then learn how to fight, fight it and then carry out an immune response. This takes time. And while that time is happening, the virus can replicate, replicate to a level beyond what your immune system can handle. And that means that you'll get sick. But with the vaccine, your body can more quickly identify the virus and skip straight to starting the immune response. A common question that we've heard with the Filipino community is wondering about how come there was such a short time frame for vaccine development? Well, the answer is that mRNA technology is actually not new and it's the product of over decades of study on RNA therapies and treatment by medical scientists. And these therapies are being used for cancer treatments as well as vaccines for diseases such as the Zika virus. Researchers are also exploring how mRNA can help with blood clotting disorders such as hemophilia. Usually the slowest part of vaccine development isn't finding candidates uh, treatments, but actually testing them. Because of um, the amount of funding that went into vaccine development, we were able to do things that often take years a lot quicker. They were able to do the tests in animals and then in humans. And human testing requires three phases that involve increasing numbers of people and escalating costs. The COVID-19 vaccines went through all of these same trials that we normally do, but the billions of dollars poured into the process made it possible for companies to take financial risks by running some tests at the same time. These, uh, this is a table of all the current vaccines that are available. And we've listed the efficacy, the manufacturer, whether or not it's currently FDA approved and the type of vaccine and the doses. So you can see, Again, Pfizer and Moderna are the first two that are currently available and they both require two doses. What about vaccines for children? That's a common question we're also getting um, on Tayo Help. Well, 
Vaccinations are currently available for ages 16 and 17 um, from Pfizer, and they've been tested in those ages, and 18 and above for Moderna. The timing of vaccine availability for younger children below 16 will depend on the pace of clinical trials that are actually currently underway right now, and then tr clinical trials that are planned for those who are 12 and under. At this time, severe illness due to COVID-19 is rare among children, but for those that have gotten it, there's actually been 227 children who have died from the virus in the US as of January. So because children are not currently recommended for vaccination if they're below 16 because it's not available yet, this means that a large majority of adults in our community must choose to be vaccinated overall in order to achieve herd or community immunity. This is where when we have a large part of the population of an area immune to a specific disease. If enough people in the community are resistant to a disease, then that disease has nowhere to go. So herd immunity will protect at-risk populations such as babies who, and those who, um, whose immune systems are weak and can't get resistance on their own. Currently, it's estimated that in order to get community or herd immunity, we need um, thresholds for COVID-19 are 60 to 70%. Another common question we're getting is, you know, what are the most common post-vaccination symptoms? Um, and these include local reactions that are listed here, pain and swelling, redness at the injection site. Um, some people can get fever, fatigue, headache, chills, myalgias, and um, pain in their joints. Um, and usually, depending on the vaccine and the age group and the and um, the vaccine, um, approximately 80 to 89 percent of vaccinated persons will actually have at least one of those symptoms. Um, after I got my second COVID vaccine, which was Pfizer, I did have some um, like tiredness and fatigue. And then after my first vaccine, I did have some like redness at the site, which went away within uh, 24 hours. Most of these um, local things are mild and um, they're actually more common in those who are uh, younger than older persons. As far as adverse events, um, um, these are very rare and usually these events are seen during the first six weeks post-vaccination and more than 90% of these occur within two months. The clinical trials or studies followed everyone for at least two months when these vaccines were released. And um, the trials follow also everyone for at least two months afterwards. So now we have data that's longer and there have been no uh, worrisome safety signals so far. Rare events might only become obvious after millions of doses have been administered, um, but obviously years of safety data may not yet be available. But for all vaccines, there's ongoing surveillance and um, for side effects in place. And again, no concerns so far have been found. In terms of um, side effects that we do know of, the only side effect that has been reported is anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions. And this is pretty rare. Um, this occurs at 2.8 cases per million of doses of Moderna and five cases per million for Pfizer. Um, as of January 24, there's actually been 9.9 .9 million doses of Pfizer that have been administered in the US and 7.5 million in Moderna for Moderna. Um, and the CDC says that the people who have an immediate allergic reaction to the first dose of either Pfizer or Moderna shouldn't get their second. So the only other uh, contraindications uh, for the vaccines are, as I mentioned, severe allergies or uh, allergy, allergy to the first dose of the COVID vaccine, and also allergies to polyethylene glycol, which is a component of the vaccine, and another um, compound called polysorbate, which is related to polyethylene glycol. 
What about people who have severe allergies to anything else like insects, medications, or foods? They are actually allowed to get the COVID-19 vaccine, but they should remain at the site where the injection was given for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes that the general population is recommended to wait. Another common question that we are getting is, if I've already had COVID-19 and recovered, do I still need to get vaccinated with the, vac with the vaccine? And the answer is yes. Um, and that's because experts do not know yet how long you are protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19. If you've already recovered from COVID-19, it is possible, although rare, that you could get infected with the virus um, again. So another question that we're getting is, how long will the vaccination protect you? And how long does it take for a vaccine to begin providing immunity? As everyone knows, this disease and the vaccine are new. And so we don't know yet how long immunity will last after either infection with the virus or vaccination. Um, what we do know is that COVID-19 has caused various serious illness and death for a lot of people. And if you get COVID, you risk giving it to loved ones who may get very sick. So getting a COVID-19 vaccine is a safer choice. Based on preliminary data that we have to date, scientists feel confident that people are not likely to be reinfected within 90 days of infection. And preliminarily, that's what they're saying um, also after getting um, two doses of the vaccine. So what can we do to help our family members in our community um, to get the vaccine? I think it's very important to be aware of circulating misinformation, which our next speaker, speaker is going to be talking about. Um, it's important to go to medical professionals and qualified researchers who've studied the vaccine extensively, encourage them to talk to their doctor. Um, it's very important to ask um, your loved ones what they're uh, worried about or afraid of so you can have open discussions. Remind them of the facts that getting sick from COVID is more serious than, than the possible post-vaccine symptoms. Also remind them that vaccines will help them protect others, um, especially vulnerable populations and including children who don't have access to the vaccines yet. And this is really gonna help us get um, society back to normal sooner, um, especially if we reach levels of community immunity. So um, there's a lot in our toolbox that can help us protect our loved ones and ourselves and our um, community from COVID. Um, so please continue in addition to get vaccinated, wear a mask, stay six feet from others, wash your hands often and model to others uh, when you get the vaccine, as you can see here. Um, so with some of us um, Filipino um, healthcare workers getting the vaccine. I added um, a resource here. There, there was recently a CDC national forum on COVID-19 vaccine. And um, the website here has tape recorded um, um, sessions for that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Javier um, for your presentation. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Susana Gonzalez, who will be uh, giving a presentation called Fighting COVID-19 Misinformation, a Case for News Literacy, and she'll be talking to us about how to tell uh, what information is fact and what's not. Hi all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this event. I'm, I'm so glad to be here with you. My name is Susanna Gonzalez and I'm the Director of Education and Content at the News Literacy Project, which is a national nonpartisan education nonprofit. Before joining NLP, I worked in 
journalism for more than 20 years. Even before the pandemic, it could be difficult to know what to believe. And now with COVID-19, misinformation can be a matter of life and death. Here is a snapshot of the current information landscape. Um, actually, this is a snapshot from, uh, from 2020. The news and information ecosystem has changed and grown tremendously. We're now faced with the most complex information landscape in history. We not only get news and information from newspapers, television and radio, but now we, get, we also get it from many other places such as websites, social media, blogs and podcasts. So this slide shows a 2020 snapshot of the current information landscape in one minute. COVID-19 news and information is coming from many directions. The World Health Organization has described this overabundance of COVID-19 information as a quote unquote infodemic. Officials have noted that some of this inundation of information is accurate and some of it is not. So how can we spot misinformation? And what can we do to actively counter misinformation? Here are some key ways to fight misinformation. First, determine whether what you're looking at is news or opinion. And we will explore news versus opinion in just a bit. Second, check it out. Don't assume that information is accurate and don't take information at face value. Chase facts. Keep in mind that in a developing story like COVID-19 or the COVID vaccines, new facts can change a story and lead it in a brand new direction. When you encounter information you're unsure of, take steps to verify its accuracy. Check to see if a reputable news organization is reporting the same information or verify the information yourself with original sourcing, such as official documents of it that may be available online or statements from public officials, um, or as the previous speaker said, you know, consult your medical healthcare workers. Another way to fight misinformation is to consider the source. Ask yourself, is the person or entity providing information trustworthy and reliable? Do they have the authority to speak about the subject? Also, what's their motiv motivation? If it's not immediately clear who they are, do, a quick, do quick research on the source before accepting that the information they are providing is true it's important to consider who is providing this information. Just because your friend said it, or just because your, your friend shared it, does not mean it's true. Ask, where did this information originate? Unfortunately, we can't trust all information on the internet is factually accurate. At this moment, we cannot rely on social media companies such as Facebook, to vet and check all information on their platform. Social media companies have taken steps to identify misleading and false information for users, but there is room for more action to be taken. Next, seek out information from standards-based news organizations which follow a set of ethical guidelines that are publicly available. These guidelines and standards indicate that this is a credible, believable source of news and information. If you're unsure whether a news organization is standards-based, do a search for their guidelines and take notice and be wary about news sources that don't have such guidelines in place. 
A last key way to fight misinformation is to seek all relevant sides of a story. Standards-based news journalists present you with all relevant perspectives of a story so that you as a reader or listener or viewer or decision maker can come to your own judgment and opinion about a topic. Looking at coverage that provides a variety of relevant perspectives provides you with a broader view and it also gives a more balanced understanding of an issue. Now more about news versus opinion. As a first step to evaluating a news article, determine whether what you're encountering is a piece of news or opinion. News reports aim to present information in a fair and accurate way, and they include all relevant sides of a story. Also, news articles are timely and they're written on the same day of a news event. If it's a news article, make some quick key observations. For example, take note of the date and time. Articles often get recycled online, but in a news event that's developing, constantly changing and fluid like COVID-19 and the vaccines, it is especially important to verify that the information you're encountering is the most up-to-date information available. On the other hand, opinion pieces are meant to show a specific point of view. Opinion pieces from standards-based news organizations are marked with labels such as opinion, column, commentary, editorial, viewpoint, or perspective. Look for these labels. If you see a piece labeled as such, just be aware that it, it intends to show a particular point of view and tries to persuade you to adopt or support their point of view. Following these tips can help you navigate this so-called infodemic. It will help you sort fact from fiction and recognize both credible information as well as misinformation. It will help you to be more informed so that you can be in a stronger position to make good decisions. And they will also give you a better understanding of the news gathering process. Let's take a look at some examples. Here's an example of a piece of misinformation from a March 2020 issue of The SIFT, which is a news literacy project newsletter that I help write. This image claimed to show a mass burial site for people who died from COVID-19. However, it is false. It actually shows a scene from the trailer for the 2011 movie Contagion. This image and claim were shared on Facebook and Twitter hundreds of times. If I were encountering an image like this one that I wasn't sure about, I would closely evaluate the post, the source of the post and take note of the date and time I would also look at the comments to see if questions were being raised about the post's accuracy and if there was a fact check posted. In the absence of a source, inquire further. Ask where the information came from and highlight questionable sourcing and claims. Here's another example. This, this rumor circulated also last March. The rumor was that people of color may be immune to COVID-19 because of melanin, which is the natural uh, pigment that gives human skin and hair its color. This rumor is not true. Dark skin and higher levels of melanin do not protect people from COVID-19. Here's another example. This claim um, is related to the deaths of two Pfizer vaccine trial participants. This, this claim circulated in December and it's misleading. The two people did not die as a result of the injections. They died from other causes. Let's take a look at one more claim. Another piece of information that has been proven false is the rumor that COVID-19 started in a lab 
this has been uh, debunked several times. But let's say you heard this piece of information and you weren't sure whether it is true. What can you do? You can do a fast internet search for COVID lab rumors as seen here in this slide. And you'll see you get a lot of results. The first result is an item from the United Nations with a headline that says COVID-19 extremely unlikely to have come from a lab. Let's click and read more. So first, take note of the date of this item, February 9, 2021. This was published recently. And then you see in the section just below the date that the item says the virus that causes COVID-19 probably jumped from animals to humans and, and is extremely unlikely to have come from a laboratory, the head of an international team investigating the origins of the disease said. And this is coming from the United Nations Agency, which is an expert source. Let's take a look at another item from the internet search. This item, it was the last item on the first page of the search. It's an article from the Associated Press the Associated Press, or AP, which um, is a standards-based news organization. They adhere to the guidelines and standards that I referred to earlier, and we know that this is a credible source of news and information. The headline says, research shows COVID-19 was not manufactured in a lab. Let's click to read more. Again, take notice of the date. September 16, 2020, this was published in the fall. And you can see along the left side that this is a fact-checking article. It says that the claim that they investigated was um, COVID-19 is a man-made virus intentionally manufactured in a lab and released to the public. And AP found that this claim is false. Doing a quick internet search like this can help you confirm whether a claim is true or false. To conclude, I, I just like to point out two useful news literacy project infographics. One is this how to know what to trust infographic. It details steps you can take to determine whether you can believe a claim and it is available at this link here. A second infographic, uh, sanitize before you share. Um, I also recommend this one. This is available on our website, newslit.org. This infographic shows four quick steps that you can take to stop the spread of misinformation. In the same amount of time that, it, that we're advised to wash our hands, 20 seconds, we can debunk information. And that's about this the amount of time it took me to do that search about the claim about the um, about COVID-19 originating in the lab, which was false. Step one, pause. Be aware if you're having a strong reaction to a piece of information. If you are, the piece of information may very well be misinformation because misinformation is designed to make you have a strong reaction. Step two, glance at the comments. Look for a link to credible information. Look for a link to a fact check or look to see if people are raising questions about the claims credibility. Step three, do a quick search. Just as I did with the false claim that COVID-19 originated in a lab, search to see if credible sources are reporting the same information. Step four, ask for the source. If there is no source of information, do not share it. Also inquire further and highlight questionable sourcing and claims. If you find evidence that a claim is not true, alert other people. 
If you still aren't sure, do not share it. Because if you share information that turns out not to be true, there are possible effects, there are possible effects down the line. The people you share that misinformation with could have shared it with other people. Be a proactive sharer of credible information. A final point I'll make is this. Checking whether a claim is true may mean taking extra effort on your part. But these extra efforts are well worth the effort when it comes to your health and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I think that was really helpful, especially because there is just so much information out there about the pandemic. So that was really helpful. Um, and, and just knowing how we can um, figure out if a source is trustworthy or not. So thank you. Great, my pleasure. Um, we're next going to hear from Dr. Antonio Moya. Um, he's going to be sharing his experience as a frontliner who has received the vaccine. And he's also going to share some updates from the LA Department of Health Services, as well as updates on the COVID vaccinations. Great, thank you, uh, Agnes, and thank you everyone for having me. So uh, we're now approaching almost a one year anniversary of living this type of life in the hospital and in the clinics, uh, just so that you all kind of uh, see it, at least my own experience. Uh, it's been really a roller coaster of emotions at the hospital from the time when we didn't know anything about, the, about COVID-19 to this point in time now where the numbers are actually dropping and we now have two and soon to be three vaccines available. Um, early on uh, in, in all of this, uh, there was a lot of misinformation out there about COVID-19, which is uh, really important as, as a community. Uh, and uh, Susanna uh, talked about this as well, but spreading the correct information out there. Um, in the LA County system, so I work in the Department of Health system, um, we have been uh, able to have access to the vaccine as early as December 18th. So I have a little show and tell here. I have our... Uh, uh, you can't really see it <laughs> because it's color white, um, but I have my CDC COVID-19 vaccination record card. Uh, and so when they started opening up the vaccines to healthcare workers, uh, there would be lines up to two or three hours on day one. And that was at arriving at 6 a.m. Um, but it definitely was an exciting moment. And I really hope that uh, the moment comes when all Americans can have access to the vaccine. Uh, that being said, uh, there are, are you know, some healthcare providers and workers who are still hesitant to get the vaccine. Uh, and I, I know that um, working in my clinic, some of the people uh, in my clinic have not received the vaccine, uh, but this is the reason why we need to spread that information about why the vaccine is so important, uh, not only in the hospitals and clinics, but also in our communities. Um, at this point, uh, I think there's a projection that uh, you know, vaccines are going to continue to increase, especially in California. I, I know Melanie and uh, many other people can share resources on how we all can get vaccinated. Um, but really, from a public health standpoint, that is what we need to do on top of, you know, wearing our masks, uh, physically distancing uh, and washing our hands regularly. Um, the other thing that I've noticed in the hospital is that early in the pandemic, I, I take most uh, care of stroke patients. So there was a lot of hesitation for uh, people in the community uh, to go to the hospital because they were afraid of contracting COVID at the hospital. Um, I can assure you as, as a stroke doctor that uh, it is safe if you are having an emergency like a heart attack, stroke, or a seizure, or any kind of emergency, do not hesitate to call 911 and go to the hospital immediately to get care. Um, when we do have COVID patients, they are put in an isolated room uh, and we make sure to take every single precaution to make sure nobody gets uh, COVID from those patients. Um, there are other things that I would love to talk about, but I wanna uh, open up the Q&A for later on just because we have a, a limited amount of time. Uh, so if you have any questions about you know, my personal experience in the hospital or what's happening in Los Angeles, I'm happy to share with that with all of you. 
Thank you, Dr. Maya. Yeah, if anybody in the audience has any questions, um, just a reminder, you can feel free to plug that into the chat and we'll have a couple of minutes after all the panelists speak to get to your questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Moya. Um, lastly, we're going to hear from Melanie Sabaraliwag, who is going to talk to us about the impact of COVID-19 on the Filipino-American community. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so thank you so much for having me today. Um, I definitely wanna be uh, mindful of time. And so I will cut this a little short and if anybody would like to carry on conversation into the Q and A, um, I'm sure all of us would be very much happy to, to discuss there. So again, my name is Melanie Sabato Leewag and um, I'm just gonna talk to you guys briefly about uh, COVID-19 impact on Filipino Americans, um, specifically from a perspective of Los Angeles. So I just wanted to start off with a quote, um, and it, it resonates deeply considering of what is happening today. And it is that healthcare is an important determinant of health and lifestyles are also important determinants of health. But it is the factors in the social environment that determine access to these health services and influence lifestyle choices in the first place. And so that's actually from the WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Margaret Chan. And so from my perspective, I can talk about how COVID-19 has really impacted the community. And um, oftentimes it gets convoluted because there's so many topics to talk about. Um, but as you can notice that COVID-19 is a complex issue um, and it is requiring a lot more conversation, dialogue and time for us to really provide a real perspective as well as a real opinion um, in order for us to kind of provide insight to our friends and families about our choices or our decisions regarding COVID-19 and possibility of getting the vaccination if you have yet to get it. So the Filipino community um, is a resilient one. I think one of the biggest things that we hardly ever notice is that we've been here for over a century, um, but we've done a great job with assimilating to the environment, considering um, our proficiency in the English language, um, we often have surnames that are mixed in with the uh, Latin and Hispanic culture. And we also are very unfamiliar with making our Asian stance, um, such as businesses not necessarily having um, an Asian type of uh, typology when we put these businesses. So we're often assimilating or hidden, or what most people right now are saying are invisible in terms of COVID-19 and the impact in our community today. So this is actually um, done recently in October of 2020, and it was the festival um, in historic Filipino town in Los Angeles a few months ago. So I wanted to share with you all uh, from a wonderful friend of mine, she actually just uh, started to publish this as we start to think about how to provide real in-time information um, among Filipinos and about Filipinos for Filipinos. Um, utilizing national and big data sets from um, uh, the, the federal government. Um, and so this is actually a percentage of how many Filipinos exist among populations of Asians throughout various counties in the United States. And what you can see is most shocking about this is that we're everywhere. And I think it is a fascinating um, demographic um, considering that Asians are often seen as Chinese and Korean and Thai, um, but what people don't realize are Filipinos are actually the second largest Asian population in the United States. So what is COVID-19's impact on communities? A lot of people think that it's a linear fashion of impact, but what we often know is that it has a cascading event, not necessarily linear. And so when we often talk about disease infection and spread, we cannot isolate one conversation from another. It is very intermixed. It is very much a multidisciplinary and multi-level conversation because many factors in, uh, actually influence how fast a disease spreads and how well uh, the community can recover from the disease infection and spread. 
So oftentimes people know cultural culture is a big one. It, it might often be a system in which one is born into, such as the culture that we live here in LA, but it also could be the culture in which you have also adopted, where you identify the most. There are individual factors, of course, such as your gender and your personality traits, some physical attributes and your mental state. But as we know, COVID-19 has been severely impacting the Filipino community, specifically in socioeconomic realms. And we don't talk about it often because we live in multi-generational households. We often are seen as high educators, but we are also experiencing high occupation um, issues and instability such as, um, and perpetuated um, through very systemic issues such as racism, um, which one of the biggest things that are happening right now is the movement um, for Angelo as well, Quinto. The other things that we also must be uh, thinking about in terms of COVID-19 and its impact on the Filipino community is all the different issues that we often take for granted, such as the environmental impact of where we live and how we live together. How do we get around? How do we commute our transportation? The density in which we live and what is accessible to us. There are political realms in which we are unfamiliar. Sometimes we just choose to not pay attention but we re must remain citizens and civic servants to make sure that we're engaging in this political process. Lastly, as we often are seeing and has um, described by Dr. Javier in the beginning was the features of the disease. The fact that transmission is high right now um, in specific types of occupations and uh, among specific ages, um, but we often are leaving out the other conversations that are, sev that are severely impacting our community, which is how are we preventing and then treating other people post COVID. So one of the things that we often don't think about is the indirect impact of COVID-19. Some people often just say, let's talk about the direct impacts and oftentimes, I apologize, um, the direct impacts are what is mostly what you see in the news. And the reason for that is because it is mostly attainable through data. You often can see symptom, symptomology severity. You'll often see the risk of severity and the challenges of those with underlying diseases. We often see how often people are getting screened or not screened, people who are losing financial stability and whether or not they're moving around through your phone. GPS is a big one for, um, for understanding how quickly people are moving around. But there's an indirect impact within the Filipino community that we often have to describe further. One is what we see more likely is the home fatigue and the psychosocial mental health impacts that are uh, plaguing our young children, our um, older folks as well. Isolation is real and fraud and vulnerability to elderly abuse is also an indirect impact of COVID-19. Other things such as loss of livelihood, reallocation of research efforts, as well as uh, reallocation of um, clinical care, um, lingering disability, and the increased use of telemedicine. Um, but one of the biggest things we're often not thinking about is the stigma of people getting diagnosed with COVID-19 or the stigma of actually getting the vaccination. I apologize. Oh. So some of the things that I wanna um, bring up is perspectives. So oftentimes you see on the news and thank you Susanna for bringing all these things up is we must think from different perspectives. One is an epidemiological perspective of impact. So this is a big you know, understanding of numbers over time, right? That we have reached now a pinnacle of 500 thousand deaths in the United States. Um, we are only a snippet of what is happening globally. The things that we must think about is then how many people of the Asian descendants are actually dying globally, but how are they doing regionally? How are we doing that and understanding that at a regional and geographic level here in the United States? There are community perspectives and understanding how we're ascertaining that information and what are we doing with that information. There are clinical perspectives of the loss of life of all the healthcare workers and the essential workers that have died um, and we have to memorialize them. 
And we also have to have personal perspectives of people who we know have lost lives directly or indirectly due to COVID-19. And so I leave this as a topic of, of, of discussion as we move into Q&A, is that we are now moving into a new phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are in the process of now understanding that yes, we have distributed vaccinations to our essential healthcare workers and those who are more likely to have severe symptomology of COVID-19. But now there are going to be phases that are gonna happen fairly quickly that really require your uh, discussion, your dialogue and your input as well. So you have more power than you think. And so I just want to bring it there and allow people to open up for q &A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, so now we would, um, we'd want to move into the Q&A portion. And if anyone has any questions, I just want to invite folks to type that into the chat. And you can feel free to ask and direct, direct any of the questions to any of the panelists. Um, so I'll just give maybe like a couple seconds to see if anyone has any questions. Um, and also if anyone has questions that you might think of later, again, I wanna invite folks to join our Facebook group, um, which I will share again in the chat. Um, if you have any questions about the vaccine or anything related to COVID-19, um, you can feel free to share that in the Facebook group and we can share resources that will be culturally tailored to those questions. Um, so there's the link to our Facebook group. Um, so um, if, if there's no questions, I just wanted to, you know, take the time to thank all the panelists for being here this evening and for sharing various perspectives about the pandemic for the Filipino community. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you to everybody who question. took the time to, I'm sorry. May I? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, and, um, I um, I was listening. I, I may have uh, missed it. Do we have um, a precise figure or at least a cred credible figure on uh, how much uh, willingness do uh, Filipino Americans have in taking the vaccine? Do we have any figures on that? Yeah, is that something any of the panelists can answer? Yeah, I can talk figures? about that briefly. Okay. Um, so there has been numerous studies in the past about just vaccination hesitancy in the past among Asian um, Pacific Islanders. Um, and it's often seen that Asians are have low hesitancy. But as we know that um, we're starting to find out that more and more healthcare workers, for instance, that were uh, opened to get the first tier uh, vaccinations, um, we're more likely to hold off. Um, not, they don't like to call it vaccination hesitancy, um, but some, some people have actually declared that they would want to have waited um, due to various reasons. Um, but the numbers seem, um, the numbers in which we're going to talk about vaccination hesitancy or vaccination willingness at this point is very nominal, considering that people are trying to ascertain that information now. But in previous studies, it's shown that Asians in general are more likely to get vaccinations than other ethnic or racial groups. Um, do I agree that's true? That's a different story. And I think that's one of the things that many of our palace really are advocating for is data disaggregation, which proves whether or not specific types of ethnic groups within Asian uh, subpopulations are more or less likely uh, to get the vaccine. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, um, I asked this question because a recent poll in uh, the Philippines only had 19% among Filipinos who are willing. I mean, and um, there's a lot that something like uh, 40 plus are not willing to get it. And I don't know if it's cultural, cu cultural or uh, maybe uh, there's some mistrust in the vaccine itself. So I asked if uh, Filipino Americans are also the same. I, I believe people are actually uh, in our community are trying to create 
uh, research surveys for Filipino Americans specifically. Um, and I believe Dr. Melissa Isa Palma is working on that right now. Um, a lot of patients' behaviors are shaped by history. So I, I'm sure Dr. Javier could talk a, a lot about the dengue vax, uh, you know, controversy in the Philippines and how that's maybe shaped how Filipinos in the Philippines uh, react to vaccines. But uh, here in the United States, I think it's uh, just, you know, anecdotally <laughs> for what that's worth, um, there are nurses who are Filipino Americans I work with on both sides who want, who want to take it and who also do not want to take it. Yes, uh, hope, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, just, just to add to Dr. Moya, um, you're right that it is cultural differences. It's also political differences. Um, and so you have to understand that when the rollout happened and maybe when these polls were taken, were before the rollout. And there was a lot of different uh, polls that were taken before December. Um, and so there was a difference in how people viewed the vaccine be in, in the transition during the Trump administration and the Biden administration. I mean, as we know, um, about 80 to 90% of Filipinos identify themselves as Christian or Catholic. And that also plays a huge role considering that many of their beliefs are very tied to conservative views, um, which are often tied to more of the previous administration's um, you know, actions towards the vaccine. So um, there could be a cascade of events um, it, that are highlighted from both the past and the current climate. If I may request, uh, if you have any uh, study, because uh, I, I, uh, I would share this to my readers too, if you have any um, study, if you can share it with us, uh, even through email, even after this, I would appreciate it much. Thank you very much. We will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your question. Um, well, we've uh, we've kind of hit the, the end of the panel, so I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thank you again to uh, our panelists um, and also just for everybody who took the time to be here with us this evening. Um, I also want to thank our our Tagalog interpreter, Sandy Kanlas, for um, providing the panel um, to folks in Tagalog so that folks that wanted to listen to it in Tagalog could do that. Um, I also want to just say thank you to Danielle Fox, who is the engagement editor at USC Center for Health Journalism, to Angela Alejandro, to Sarah Mae Dizon, and Lizelle Tanglao for helping put this panel together um, and also for helping with our Facebook group um, and just with the content that we're able to share there. Um, I also want to share that the slides that uh, our panelists shared today will be available sometime within a week after um, today. So if um, anyone's interested in having those resources, um, those uh, slides will be uh, available and we'll, we'll uh, share them in the Facebook group as well. Um, so thank you again, everybody for attending. Um, and that concludes this panel and I hope that you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.